All right, brother. We are with Paul Mort. This is Amir Anzor, and I'm really excited by this interview because Paul Mort is someone that I've really looked up to uh, over the last couple of years. I think I've been following him for four or five years, and I've done coaching from him. He has this infamous program, The Unstoppable 28. If you check it out uh, online, you'll it'll change your life for the better. And basically, Paul is just a really intellectual guru he he swears so I, I told him intellectual to... is that that's the first time i've ever heard anybody yeah. say that but but when you follow his philosophies you you really learn a lot about life right like it'll change the perspective of your life so if you're going through a hard time you're you're suffering from anxiety uh you're, you're going broke in business you're going through a divorce or or things could be going well for you and you simply want to take your life to that next level because you know that you can you can do that. Paul is your your man. You can check him out at paulmort.com. You can see his really interesting story and you can join his Unstoppable 28 program. And he has uh, a couple of books out. I, I believe you just you're launching a, a new book. Uh, dude, I have just finished my new book, but you mentioned the swearing. The I know. Swearing. It had a swear word. It's basically freaking, the title. Was, freaking. The title was a swear word. Yeah. And the publisher said, there's four people reading it at the minute. They're like, Paul, we we'll really love the book, but you can't call it that. I'm like, okay. And I was like, listen, if you sign, if you give me the deal, you can call it anything you want, mate. <laughs> okay. So uh, when is that coming out? Is that coming well, out? I do not know. It, it'll be this year, but I don't okay. know just because but I'm trying to get the best deal I can to get the book into the most hands that I can. Like okay. the, where I'm at right now is I don't need the payment. So I'm like, if you promise to get me on the shelves so I can get help more people, I'm good. Yeah, so, I, I read your other book. I believe it was freaking unstoppable. Um fudging, fudging unstoppable. Yes. Fudging unstoppable. Yeah. And um yeah so so Paul basically produces some amazing content that really helps people in their life. But Paul, how did you get in that position to be able to think and help people through that sort of mindset when things are not going so well in their lives. Yeah. Amazing. So I, I, I my speaking coach, so I have a coach who helps me with the speaking stuff. And then um, he tells me off for saying what I'm about to say, but essentially I stumbled into it. I had no plan to do what I'm doing now. So you mentioned it before in, in 2014, I was rock bottom. I had done too much drinking for too long too much cocaine for too long, too much isolating myself for too long. This is a lot of stuff that I did too long and it all caught up with me. And I would, we, we were talking about it before coming on, I would blame the my da bipolar diagnosis for my behavior. And I'll be, oh, well, I'm bipolar. That's why I do this. That's why, there's just a lot of justification. And then I just realized one day through all the courses that I've done, the study that I've done, because that was a wake up call for me that the, I was suicidal. And I can remember the day was the 19th of December, 2014 it was just a big wake up call for me. Now, the beauty of where I was at was despite gaining five stone in weight, despite being doing a lot of cocaine, a lot of drinking, despite being in that place mentally and physically, that was a dark hole. I'd still built a successful business. That was part of the problem, if I'm honest. So I was able to go and invest and spend and have coaches and mentors and go to retreats and boot camps and seminars and all that kind of stuff that, that people love. And I just started to realize more and more that I had created that myself. I didn't end up suicidal by mistake. I didn't end up there by, by serendipity or I didn't end up there by... um coincidence more by consequence so i just obviously i then leveled up there was i did a lot of work on myself lost all the weight got off the medication completely and one day well there's two things happened one the guy that i was working with when i first started getting my life together um he was just like paul you should be doing this you should be working with originally men. You should be working with men. You've got, you can tell a story. You know how to speak. You know how to run a business. You've been through a lot. You've got kids, you're married and all of that. So he was like, you need to be coaching people. And then one day, I mean, I was, I was making videos for a different business that I've got. And I said to my camera guy, I said, Mark, 
I've just got something I need to say. And he said, okay. I said, can you set the camera up over there? And it was actually next to where I'd been suicidal. And I just told this story from my heart. I just basically said what I'd been through and how it felt. And that video is now on like 12 million views. And the more I talked about my problems and how I'd overcame them, with no intention, by the way, of having a business doing this or a career, because I had a successful, I had two successful businesses already. So I didn't need a third business. That year, 2015, I also um, I sold one of the businesses. So I was even, I had a bit more freedom. And I just kept talking about it and talking about it. And people just seem, it just seemed to resonate with people because people say that I was able to talk about the struggles, the challenges, the frustration, the pain, the difficulty, the, all of that stuff. I was able to talk about it in a way, particularly that British men got. They just got it. And I think it's because, because I've been through, I was able to describe their challenges better than they could, <laughs> which was very interesting for me. Um, and then it just kind of just went from there. And I fell in love with coaching people and helping people and advising people and mentoring people. And then it's kind of been nonstop since. And I just think my wife said, I'm, this is what I'm good at. I'm, I seem to be pretty good at taking complex information about the brain, about emotions, about how the mind works, about human behavior and make it like my level, like dummy level. <laughs> I'm, I'm able to simplify quite con, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Confusing stuff for people, so it's complex. I'm able to simplify complex things in the language and analogies, especially that people can get. Oh yeah, that's me. It's like, I get these comments all the time in me where it's like, it's like you're talking directly to me. And I'm like, well, I am. <laughs> I needed to read that today. I needed to hear that today. You're describing me. And I'm like, I'm just talking to me four years ago, five years ago, six years ago. So yeah, that's it really. And the rest is, like I say, I'm I'm kind of bumbling my way through. <laughs> no, I, I mean, look, I, I listen to your information a lot. I consume you've got a telegram group and you've got um you, you've got so much. And, and and you've got a lot of information. I was just wondering how someone like you comes up with that kind of um philosophies and and is it by attending seminars or do you read a lot of books? Uh, Neither. or you listen to audio books and then you kind of put it in your own words. That's a great question. I suppose some of all of that, but I am not a, I'm a prolific content creator, I would say. I'm a prolific communicator, but I'm actually not a prolific reader or consumer. Um, I love more than anything to go to live events. Like I don't do very, it's weird this. I don't do very well with online courses. I don't, I struggle to consume it. Clearly I'm ADHD, clearly. I don't talk about it much because it's, it's just, people, everyone's talking about it. I was diagnosed with that in 2000 and late 2011. So a long time ago. Um, and see, I'm lost already. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm lost. Um, where was I? Yeah, I love an in-person, like an immersion experience. And then I'm able to just communicate the things that I learned. But the main way I'm able to produce and teach this content is just through life experience. Mm -hmm. I'll take things and I'll try it. And if I feel like it works, I might change it and tweak it and then be like, and this is, so a lot of it, someone asked me this last week, I had a, I had a man in for a, a business consultation, a half day. And he's like, Paul, how do you come up with the content? I'm like, honestly, from my own journal, I learn stuff from experiences. I do a lot of crazy challenges and physical stuff and I share my business experience and I've got I'm I'm, I'm kind of just describing real life that's it and do you yeah, think but... because you, you know I, I was in London right now I'm in, in Pakistan but I, I was in London and so I'm 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 British basically but uh your points hit home and you are UK's master coach twice uh twice yeah. Do you think that you appeal more to British people or people around the world? Americans can relate mm. just as much as Europeans, yes. as Middle Eastern um, people? Or do you think people around the world have different sort of character traits? What a great question. I think we were talking about this before and my accent. A lot of there are a lot of countries that just don't understand what I'm saying. Like if I ever go to the States or Dubai, 
people are like, where are you from? And I'll say like, guess, and they'll be like, Ireland? And I'm like, no, Australia? No. <laughs> it's because it is a strange accent. And, but also be, just because I'm teaching life experiences, like, and and you know this, mate, and, and I do have clients all over the world. Like the furthest client we've got away would be Cambodia. It's probably the furthest away. Cambodia, Thailand, Bali, America, Dubai, Spain, France, Switzerland, uh, Austria. We've got an Austrian lady just all over the world. But I think my message particularly resonates with British men just because I'm living a particularly British man's lifestyle. Like I, I think it does resonate with a lot of people, but I think British men, there's a lot of things that you can do in Britain that you couldn't do in America. Like, And British men tend to not be open to the whole manifestation crystals rubbing oil on your nipples like they're not like they're just not into the whole i remember so for example if you go to a tony rob have you ever been to a tony event yeah yeah i've done them life mastery everything british people just want especially a room full of british people hey hug the person next to you and you're like whoa <laughs> yeah. no oh i remember one event i went to with me where you had to rub noses with the person next to you and I was up for it. But if I'm in a theater full of British men who are drinking lager at my live show, because I'm not the, clearly I do conference rooms and hotel ballrooms and that, but I also do theater shows. And if I ask them to do anything like that, they'll be, it, the hell will break loose, right? So I think the way that I talk, the way that I describe things resonates with British men, especially British businessmen, just a little bit more. A little bit more. Also like, I noticed you were like a, a bit about quitting drinking alcohol and yeah. the, the hate you get because Dude, you're in Britain. You know how crazy is it? Yeah. So the, I will never understand why me talking about something that causes so many problems for people, that causes seven types of cancer, that causes most breakups and fallouts and one night stands and cheating and like it causes a lot of it's a huge factor in mental health. And me talking about it right now is actually getting me criticism. I'm like, why would that ever be bad? Yeah. Would you say the same if I was talking about quitting cannabis? Would I say the same if I was talking about quitting cocaine? You wouldn't, but it's the same thing. But but it's a part of the culture. And, you know, I've always been a bit shy about saying, like, preaching, don't drink yeah. alcohol. Me because, too. Like, uh, you, you've seen it from your content I, I see it from your content i'm like hey it's your choice yeah isn't it crazy like i think it's it's actually people justifying their own behavior not yeah. that i don't feel like they're attacking me i feel like they're trying to justify it themselves so they feel better and you know i don't really even say don't drink i just share what's working for me and i answer questions for people that say how do you do it i don't go in and say i hey, don't it's so strange to me yeah, but, but at the what, same time, humans are predictable. What, what are the um? What are like what, some of the biggest things that people do tend to come to you? Like they are, in, you know, are they usually rock bottom when they come to you, or or is it just that life is not going as well as it could do? The second one, because rock bottom people, I, I'm not saying I don't. There's so much variety in my in my life and with my clients. But clearly there are some common denominators. People do come out of rock bottom, but often they're not ready. Like they've just got to see a better vision of the future. They might need a doctor more than they need me because ultimately I'm not a medical professional. So sometimes I'll point them to somebody else, but we do get people that are suicidal. We get a lot of people that struggle with anxiety, overwhelm. But actually the people that I believe that I am best at helping that I enjoy helping the most because I've got the most in common with them. And the guys that probably get the best results are married businessmen who have done pretty well in their business, but are lost. They have their mental health on the floor. They don't like themselves. They're stressed. They spend the weekends kind of unwinding. And we all know what unwinding is in England. Like, so does this sound familiar? It's me in 2014. I just, I love working with those men the most because I understand them. And again, when I said I can describe the problems better than them, that's what I can do. And it's because I've been there. And that's why I think a lot of British men will trust me over people that might be more qualified is because I remember this to me. When I was, when I was rock bottom, 
uh, I saw all of the therapists, the psychotherapists, the psychologists, the hypnotherapists, all of them, every single ace you can think of. And the problem is, is that I would go and see somebody who was clearly highly qualified, clearly had all the certifications, doctors, professors, and then start talking and look them in the eye. And I would go, you do not get this at all. You do not, you, you may be qualified. You may be unbelievably knowledgeable. You could give me incredible advice, but me back then, I was stubborn. My ego would struggle with it. I, even asking for help was hard because I was like, I don't need help. I'm a Northern man. I'm tough. I'm, I've got a successful business. Who can tell me what to do? But I could tell, I could look them in the eye and be like, you do not understand what I'm going through. And then I would dial out. I'd be like, I'm not going to listen. Or they'd say stuff. And I, you, you, I remember one of me, uh, and you'll get this. I went to see a professor. This was the last, this is when I started to shift away from the only medication route, the, the, the whole traditional route. It just said to me, you are manic now. And I'm like, I'm not manic. You, you are, you're manic. You, you, you're showing the classic symptoms of bipolar mania. I'm like, no, this is me, normal. This is not. I have good energy sometimes. This is not manic. Um, and then she kept, she just kept rattling on. So I walked out and I never went back. And that was, that was quite a big shift for me. But yeah, I think I'm able to describe and, and work with people that I, I could, they're basically me in 2014. It's easy. It's easier. Wow. So, yeah. so when you work with people, is it, in in physical when they come see you or you yeah. you do these live events you think so, that's yeah, so, when the most powerful change happens in people's lives 100 percent. so we do the online stuff which works yeah it allows me to help more people it allows me to have a better life for myself i'll be honest because that's not that means i don't do stuff in person all the time but like i said with the remember when i was saying i love an immersion event rather than reading books i just go straight to the horse's mouth Part of me has built a business that I would love to be a part of. So the live events are just a bit more powerful. Again, trying to get a British man, again, we're generalizing here, but 80% yeah. of my clients are British men. Um, Trying to get a British man to open up over Zoom, that's hard. In person, much easier because they can't hide. They can't just hit leave. They can't mute themselves. They can't turn the camera off. They're there and they'll explain it. And just, I also love that energy. Like I love it. being around, I mean, and you'll have felt this before, being in the presence and being in that environment where people are excited about the future is dynamite. Like it is infectious. It is intoxicating that being around that energy. So I love to create, I I have the, I'm in a, the lucky position where I've been able to create that and facilitate that for other people. So we'll have most of our person, most of our events are like client events. So that's people that are in programs. Um, but in 2022, if I didn't do any last year, I speak at other people's events a lot. So I get to meet new people like that. I've been all over the world, Puerto Rico, Thailand, Dubai. Well, I turned down the gig in Dubai actually. Um, but then I also did theatre shows. And those are just a night in a theatre, a thousand people, two thousand people um, with me doing what I do. But not like, write, write this down, take notes, because you're in a theater where the lights are off and people are drinking out of pint glasses. Did you know this existed, Amir? There is a certain theaters where they have a pint glass that's actually a two pint glass. Oh, what do you mean? So it's a glass where you can pour, I believe that's probably about a liter of beer in a glass. So you don't have to keep going back to the bar. So imagine the difference between doing that in a hotel room Write this down, take a note, look at the slide. These guys are like this sitting watching me. It's so it's it, they're not all drinking, obviously, but it's so it's it's a it's a very strange vibe because I also can't see them yeah. because the lights are so bright. But those are more a combination of serious stuff where I'm able to sprinkle a little bit of humor onto it. So they come for the insights and they come for the inspiration. But actually, we have a real laugh as well. I'm I'm big on humor and fun. Like if something's not fun, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, and, and I I noticed even from your online events, like are you standing yeah. up right now? Or are you yes standing yeah. up? So you you have like high energy. Yeah. In, in you you know with your um your Zoom events or whatever yeah. master <laughs> web classes. The what? The and, crazy right? Yeah, you you put on the music and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So you've yeah. really orchestrated 
and and done the online best practice as well. So do you know what I mean? I think I think a part of me likes being in. Uh, uh, when I was at school, I was the class clown, like, yeah. and I was always sat at the front on my own or in the corridor on my own. And I think part of me, I'm, I'm, I've just been able to not like. I'm just part of me just has that. And so, you and, and, I, and I had the longest period of time, you know, Amir, where I tried to be serious all of the time, and I hated it trying to be serious and trying like wearing a suit on the stage and that it's just ain't me and i'd rather people not like who i am than just be something that i'm not and then be different on stage than i am off stage be different you see this all the time people online sometimes you meet them in person you're like whoa you're different yeah you, you seem like a. I've, this is the saying that i've got there are people that are lions on the internet the lions and then you meet them in real life and they're like a mouse <laughs> I, they can't even look you in the eye. Some of these people, it's very strange, but uh, yeah, I love um, I love all that stuff. I love the music. I love the entertainment, but I think part of the skill is that I can take something that's serious and add a little bit of, I'm going to say dark humor. Yeah. So <laughs> like you think about it, like everyone takes all the stuff too seriously. And, and what I've got a lot of friends who are in the military and the special forces. And one thing that they have, and I think I'm friends with them because they're able to, They've got that dark humor. They're able to laugh at things that are quite serious. Um, yeah. And But let's take an example. Someone yeah. that's struggling financially, right? Yes. So they're either their business is struggling or they've just lost their job or yes. they're just like finance is a, a stress in many people's lives. We're supposed to be going through a recession and all this. Sort so of I heard that this morning. Yeah. So like, yeah. you know, the media is going to tell you things are bad, but but just like people do struggle financially. How does someone get out of that? Like, how, what, what, what would be the advice that Paul Mort would say to get your, like, A, to get your, because when we're stressed financially, we, we don't think, like, we can't think straight. Even if we, let's say we I break agree. up, we go through a divorce or anything, we, like, we lose that emotional ability to think straight. Yeah. So if you're going yeah. through um, financial stress, what can you do to sort out your life? All right. So first up, I believe before we look at the financial stress, you've got to get a head around what money is. Money is an exchange of value, right? The problem with a lot of people is they think that the world owes them money. They think that they're just, they're entitled to money. And in England, that's the, it, there are, they are. People get money for doing nothing here, right? Is I heard that in Dubai, it's illegal that what, to be what? homeless or something. I heard you like in Dubai, yeah. you have to have a job. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, you you have to in Dubai. You 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 have to leave the country if you don't have a job. Basically. I've got a lot of time for that. I've got a lot of time for it. Yeah. So, so we got to understand that money flows to value. So when we spend money, we spend it on things that we value, right? So therefore, if you become a person of value, then guess what? People give you money. Companies give you money. Businesses give you money. Now, it's the the the, the other challenge with that is it's not always about it's about perception of value. So you've got to be able to show that you're valuable. That's what I'm able to do. That's what you're able to do. That's what, and again, if somebody, if I had to lay somebody off in my business, which which is not going to happen, I wouldn't choose the person that's been here the least amount of time or that's been here the longest. I would look at who brings the most value to the company. That's, I'm going to let the person that brings the least value go. That's how it works. So first up, you have to understand that. People have a lot of bullshit beliefs. Sorry, mate. That's the first time I swore. Can you believe it? We're, we're like 20 minutes in or something. By the way, Paul Board, if you go to his website, there's all these swear words and I have <laughs> a special request well, it, to watch it. But but that's that's I mean, I, I is, tell BS, be, is BS even swearing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, be you. So it's all good. <laughs> all right. So be, be, they have a lot of BS beliefs around money. And I think a lot of the time that's part of the problem. They say they say things like, oh, money goes to money. No, money goes to people that value money. So on that note, so secondly, so first up, you got to realize that money flows the value. So my first question is, how can I demonstrate more value to the world? Whether that's in business, the reason people aren't paying you because you haven't showed that time spent with you or buying your product or hiring you would help them get out of pain. We think about ourselves when it comes to money all the time, but actually it's other people giving us money. 
So therefore, what can I do for them? How can I serve them? How can I help them? What can I give them to help them get them out of pain? Because the people pay a lot of money for that. That's why people drink, to get out of pain. They don't drink for any other reason than to escape. So first up, understand that. Secondly, I think you have to do, and this is not my ideal thing because I just do, I don't like doing it. But many people, the only thing they look at with their money is the look at the bank account and how much is in it. That doesn't tell you enough. You have to do an audit of where your money's going. People that tell me they haven't got much money can never tell me where it's gone. They can't. Part of them scared to look. And that used to be me. I used to do this thing, Amir, and I only stopped doing it. Bear in mind, in 2014 was when I made my first million. I never, ever, do you know when you get money out of the ATM and the ATM asks you if you want the receipt? I never get the receipt because I went so long not wanting to see what was in. Because <laughs> I'm like, if I don't look at it, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> right? And I think that's what people do in real life. They don't actually audit where the money's gone. They just, and it's like, I have this with time. People tell me they've got no time, but they can't show me where it's gone. They have no record of it. So actually get your house in order. Where are you blowing money? What are you wasting money on? And it will blow, there's people that are struggling with money, but are spending a hundred quid every weekend on drinking drugs. They've got no money, but they're spending 20 pound a day on cigarettes. Do you know what I mean? Like, come on. So that's the second piece. But I think the first piece is, as I've been self-employed now for 24 years. So I, I'm, I couldn't, I would struggle to help somebody who was in a job to say what they should do when they've got no money. Because as a business owner, you go, how do I, where can I give more? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I, 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 so I'm not, I haven't, I'm unemployable as well. I'm, dead. I'm unemployable, but when I was, I've been self-employed since the age of 21. So I haven't even been an adult in a job. So my first thought is, when I'm struggling is, how do I, where can I, who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to help? Who do I need to give advice to? Who do I, who can I reach out to? What video do I need to, what email do I need to, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So how, it's, how it's, to create value. How did, that's all it is. And it sounds cliched and it sounds cheesy, but that doesn't mean it's not the truth. <laughs> it's not the truth. Um, but yeah, you, you want to pay rise in your job, demonstrate you're the most valuable one in your department. That's, <laughs> that's legitimately sometimes it. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is I heard that this morning, whereas it might have taken me months to find out because I don't listen to media. I don't listen to mainstream media. And I think that often that will shape our beliefs. If you are, if you are told that there's a recession, right, but the people around you are making more money than they've ever made, you're not. Do you get what I'm saying? So I believe, and he has a fact, there's never been more money in the world, ever. 40% of all money has been printed in the last three years. It's just the proportion, the distribution of it's a bit weird, right? It's a bit messed up sometimes. But if you, sir, if you, sir, if you keep hearing and seeing and talking about having no money, do you think that's going to bring more money into your life or less? It's going to bring less in because you're focused on not, you're focused on less. You're focused on not enough. However, if you are talking about, how do I create more value? How do I, what are your goals in business? What have been your wins? So we have a group of men here in my highest level program where they get one-to-one -one access to me, all business owners. And every time they're here, I'm getting record month. We had a record month in January. Normally January is terrible. We've had a record quarter. I've just hired, there is money in the world. There is money, but it just depends on where you look. So if I'm surrounded by people, who, and I'm from, Newcastle is not affluent. At all. The town that I live in, South Shields, is the seventh, I believe, or the sixth um, least affluent area in the UK. So I'm not surrounded by like affluent people. I'm not. So my mom worked in, you know, Asda or Walmart. Mm -hmm. My mom worked there for like 20 years. My dad worked in the same factory for 35 years. None of my family have business. So part of me, it, it, my life changed. And my, my thoughts around money and what was possible, because that's what we do. We don't know what's possible until you get around people that are doing it. And you realize that you're not that different to them. 
Actually, he's just been doing it longer than me, for example. Actually, he's doing stuff that I'm not. Actually, he's not doing things that I am. Maybe that's why he's further ahead. Do you know what I'm saying? So once you get around and you change your environment, that's what I love about Dubai. Dubai always has you, it makes you think a bit bigger. Abu Dhabi's even worse. <laughs> it's trying to, it's trying to be the next Dubai, isn't it? So everything's bigger. But that makes you it makes you think bigger. You're like, actually, there is money in the world. Actually, there's a lot of money in the world. But if I'm in my poor little town and I'm hanging around with my poor mates who have no ambition, then guess what I'm gonna become? I'm gonna become the, the, I'm gonna become a part of it. Like environment matters. And you you become, you know, and we said this so everyone knows that that all rubs off on you because we want, we lower our standards to fit in with what's around us. So, because we want the approval of the people we hang out with. So if everyone's talking about lack, 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 eventually we'll believe that there's lack because a belief is just a thought that you've had a lot. That's all, that's all a belief is, a thought you've had so many times that you think it's true. And most of our beliefs aren't true. They're just thoughts that we've had a bunch of times. Sometimes they're not even our thoughts. Like there's a recession is not my thought. Somebody else has said that. <laughs> I choose to believe it's not true. And this is going to sound horrible, but it's not true for a lot of people. Yeah. And Sorry, how, I have a rant there. So let's say you do have beliefs that are bringing you down. Like yes. I'm not good enough to get married I'm uh, too old to start a business. I love I'm, this question. Yeah, so so you have these beliefs um, that might be your critical mother or your critical father saying stuff to you when, yeah. when you were uh, a kid. How can you get rid of them? Or, or yeah. how can you it even be aware? Me. The problem is sometimes there are some people that have the belief, but they've also got evidence that it's true. So I'm too old to start a business. They've tried before and it failed. So therefore, they think that means it's true. Instead of looking at what did I do right, what did I do wrong, who could have, they just believe it. So here's a little framework that I have. Um, and this is from, part of it's from some of the work that I did with Byron Katie. Part of it's from some of the work that I did with Dr. John Martini, which is, let's just have a look at the thought. What's the belief? Um, is it true? Is the first question I ask. Is that actually true? Is it actually true that you are, too old to start a business. And then they, they might go, yeah. And then I say, well, can you absolutely know that that's true? And they can't absolutely know that it's true because there are people that have started businesses older than them. Do you know what I mean? Unless you're like, in, your, in the last day of your life, you, maybe it is too late. To start, do you know what I mean? Like, maybe it is, but really there's so much evidence that you're not too old and that people will pay that and you can get out of your town. You just, sometimes I believe as well, you know, Mia, I believe that sometimes we use those beliefs as a crutch, as an excuse, so that we don't have to get uncomfortable, so that we don't have to confront our fear, so that we don't have to feel uncertain. So we'll use them as a crutch. This imposter syndrome is one of those, oh, good imposter syndrome. Where did you catch that? <laughs> Who off? Who did you catch that off? Did you know you can get cream for it? Anyway, so, <laughs> sorry, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> so, someone has that belief, they've got to question it. So the first thing we're going to start asking is, is that actually true? Can I absolutely know that that belief's true? And then I start asking other questions. What's that belief costing you? So I start to create a little bit of leverage now. What's that belief costing you? Well, it's stopping me from starting. It's costing me money. Who else is that belief impacting? Now we're getting leverage on this. Oh, it's affecting me family because I'm complaining all of the time. Okay, cool. And then I just flip it around, right? What's the opposite thought? What's the opposite thought? And then we're asking, okay, well, I'm I'm not too old to start a business. All right. Um, and then I want evidence. Because the problem is with that belief, the first belief, I'm too old, it might have some evidence. Do you know, so now we have to get evidence for the opposite being as true or truer than the original. So I'm not too old to start a business. Well, what evidence have you got that that could be true? One, Colonel Sanders started his business at like 103. I don't, I don't know what the actual age is, but it was old, right? I don't know the number. Yeah, there, were, there, were, there are people that have started businesses much older. Okay, what else? Well, I'm actually not that old. Or actually, it's not about age, it's about energy. Like there's so many things that we can put in there. And then we need it, once we've challenged the belief, once we've think, oh, well, actually this could be truer than that. Then we need to take action. Otherwise it just becomes... 
pie in the sky. It just becomes fluffy. So I'll I'll say to people, all right, now we've got this new belief. There's the evidence that it will be true. What's your first step? And it might be, I'm going to tell people I'm starting the business. I'm good. So there's, there has to be an action as a result of questioning or reframing the thought. So are you a, do you uh, say that we should tell our goals to a lot of people or do you I'll, say I'll like, people? It's a, this is a great question, Amir. Sometimes I love a public declaration because I care. This is, this is why I love it. Do you know when people say I'm, I'm scared of failure? I'm scared of looking silly. Well, actually, you can use that as fuel. Most people allow it, they'll allow it to cripple them and they'll hide. I'm so scared of failure that I tell people what I'm going to do. And I do the work because I'm scared of failing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So instead of using it as a crutch, I use it as fuel, which yeah. works for me. Um, but sometimes it might not work because I think it depends on the person. So for example, if I tell people I'm going to have a year off drinking, then I back myself into a corner, which works for me. Because I, I like to be, I'm very, I'm a very honest, open guy. But for some people, if they told everybody they weren't drinking for a year, the next time they're having a night out, they're bringing attention on themselves. And some people might be like, oh, 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 oh okay, I'm going to drink. Whereas sometimes, if they haven't told anybody, they could have had an alcohol-free drink without anybody knowing. So it just, it kind of depends on the person. But I am a big fan of creating that level of accountability because it, it that that little fear of letting people down, the fear of looking silly, can be a very powerful driver for people. And yeah, let's we say, don't want to let people down. We don't want to let people down. We're great at letting ourselves down, but we don't like letting other people down. Yeah. And how do you become unstoppable in your words? Right. Like how Ooh. how do you get to that level that you are bloody unstoppable? Yeah, bloody unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'll give you i've been working on this i've been working on this the last couple of weeks actually like so we have this system called f5 so we look at focus so our thinking we look at fitness our health our body our energy our physiology um family so we look at relationships we look at finance money and we look at fun i'm a big fun's one of my biggest values as you can tell like for me there's no point having a successful business if I hate it. If it's not, if it's not fun along the way, like I mean, I I often think, could I make more money and get more opportunities if I was more serious? And the reality is, I probably could. I could probably get better gigs, get paid more by being more professional, but I wouldn't enjoy it. I would not enjoy it. And listen, we're only here once, so I want to be as successful as I can, as inspirational as I can, but whilst having fun because I've done the other thing. I've made a million pound and been miserable. I've also been a made a million pound and been ecstatic and happy and joyous and fun and not doing anything that I hate. So, yeah, it's um, I often think is is that a problem? But what I figured out this probably this last month is I've been looking at these three pillars that I think are the key to being unstoppable. The first one is having a powerful sense of purpose. So purpose isn't necessarily what you were born to do, right? I think people get obsessed with looking for that and they look so hard that they miss it. For me, purpose is a feeling. It's a sense, a sense of moving towards something or actually being pulled towards something that inspires you, a compelling vision. Many men, when they come towards me, they've lost that. They started the business and had it. And then somewhere along the line, they stop setting goals. They stop setting targets. Some men go, they, they live the British dream. Go to school, go to college, go to university, get a job, meet a girl, get married, have kids, die. That's it. Retire, then die. And so we have, you think about that. We've got a goal of getting best, decent grades in school. Then we want to get into college. Then we might want to get into uni. Then we want to get a job. And then we want to, it's not in this order all of the time, by the way. It wasn't for me. <laughs> so we have we want to get all of these things and do all of these things. And then at some point, there's no more ambition. There's no more ambition. It dies at some point. A lot of the women that I've worked with, they've had it even worse because they've had a kid. The, 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 the job is to raise that kid and then the kid will get to a certain age where they're in school 
And now the mum's like, well, what now? Because they've given up their career. So it's often, so it's this, and they end up, and I think for a lot of people, they end up wandering through life, just wandering, going backwards and forwards and round in circles. And they always end up back in the same place because they've got no direction, no sense of purpose, no fire in their belly anymore. So that's the first piece. You have to have something to move towards that inspires you, challenges your beliefs, requires you to become more than who you are now. But that's the juice. That's the inner flame, I would call it. So that's powerful purpose. The second one that I think we have to look at is swearable. The word is unfwithable. Becoming unfwithable unf is essentially becoming a master of your emotions. Becoming a master of your emotions. If you, many people, and even me sometimes on an off day, may become a victim to my emotions. I, we act on emotions. We, 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 the first sign of challenge, we fold like a pack of cards. We have a bad day at work. We, we, I, I, I think me back in the day, I would have a tough day and I would get, go and get four cans of lager. And then I realized actually that is the same as when I was a baby and my mom used to breastfeed me. I tried because I was stressed. My mom would get a breast out and I'd get the milk. So we've got grown men who are essentially breastfeeding like this, right? And, and so being able to master your emotions. And, and by the way, this is not blocking out emotions. This is just being, okay, I feel like that. How do I want to feel? And then chasing that. So mastering your emotions is the second piece. And that's a, by the way, these are both forever jobs. You don't just do them, feel unstoppable and then stop. These are forever inside jobs. And the last one, which you mentioned, which I drifted away from, if I'm honest, in terms of teaching, I drifted away from it for a bit, but it's mastering money, mastering money, mastering your thoughts and beliefs around money, developing the ability to what I call make the tail ring. So getting paid, you need that skill. That is one of the most valuable skills a human being could ever learn is how to sell. My kids already know this. So they're very good at getting what they want. <laughs> <laughs> my kids are incredible at selling they ask great questions um, so that's the second part and then the third part of that here is just saving, investing and looking at your spending, what you do with your money um, for me you get that trifecta on point that's unstoppable awesome and like how have you managed to turn something that you love doing which is coaching into yeah. a business because I, I'd imagine it must have been hard as well to be able to teach on the one hand, which yes. is what you're doing and you're giving so much value and yes. then also get people to ask people for money. And yes. then I, I'm sure that they, you were getting criticism at some stage that this this guy just wants yes. for money. All the time, all the time. So Mia, I didn't get criticized until I started becoming successful. <laughs> it's it's kind of like there's a threshold. No one says anything until you get to a certain amount of income. Nothing. Because not enough people know who you are usually. So um, how did I turn it into a business? What happened, first of all, was people started coming towards me. How have you lost all that weight? How have you, you're different to the last time I saw you? So I was going to events that I used to go to before us. So I had like a bit of a hiatus while I got my shit, while I got my things together, right? Yeah. So maybe, maybe two years where I wasn't on social media at all. So when I came back, because I didn't need that distraction, when I came back, people were like, who is this guy? What happened to the old Paul? <laughs> so, because I look different. My voice is different when I look at those old videos. My delivery, just everything's, people feel something different off me. So that happened. And I said, well, I'm going to do this thing. It started off as like a two-day event with 10 people there. Started off like that. And then I just developed it and developed it and got results and kept getting results for myself and just kept sharing that's it. Sharing, showing up, getting in front of people with the idea of, and this is the, the, the way that I look at it now. This is what I want people to think of me. Paul's free stuff is so good. Imagine what it would be like if I paid him. That's my approach. There's no hiding. There's no, every so often, and this is the great thing about, I learned this on Instagram, if I'm honest, Amir. Do you know where you do the ask a question feature? Well, on that, ask a, if, you, if I answer a question on Instagram, I've got limited text. And if I do a video, I've got limited time. So therefore, I can give some help 
but not the whole piece. So if you want to know more about this, DM me about joining my program. This is something that I cover in the program, but here are the cliff notes. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So it's actually helping people. Yeah. But, and I, I think people say, oh, have the intention of helping people without like an attachment, but that's not business. That's not the way it works. Yeah, because I, I see the way I see your marketing yeah. is basically helpful marketing, right? Yes. So you're helping like guys like me, you I got results in advance. I got yeah. the free stuff. I was like getting good value from uh, yeah. the social media. And then it was like, okay, I'll join one of these programs and then yeah. buy a book or whatever it was and then yeah. uh, get into that funnel. Yeah. But then yeah. it's, yes, you have to realize that guys like you deserve to get paid. But yeah. the challenge is that there's a lot of negativity in people saying, hey, he's absolutely he's trying to absolutely. monetize uh, helping people. Isn't that weird? Here's what happens, Amir. Here's here's what they're at my now. I'm like these guys who are coming at me, they're acting like they go to work for free. Yeah. So one of the first things I say is, Do you go to work for free? Well, no, I don't. But you expect me to. Yeah. Have you invested money in your career? Hundreds of thousands of pounds? No. I have. So should I still work for free? And then the ability to do what I do is, well, okay then, if I'm only in this for the money, why would I give three books away for nothing that it took me years to write? Why would I do all these podcasts and these videos? Shall I stop doing them and just charge money then? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I had a woman the other day complaining that she didn't want to give me her email address in exchange for the free book. Can you not just send me it? how would you want me to send you it? I'm like, because these are, again, if we talk about the at the start, these people think they're entitled to things for free. They're so entitled and they think everyone owes them something. And they're actually, they want to pay to go to work, but I shouldn't. So I'm like, what? I'm, I'm totally fine with it. And part of the reason I'm fine with it is because I give so much away. Mm -hmm. I do Q&As all of the time. I drop videos every day, useful posts, Telegram, emails. I'm like, you, 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 what else do you want me to do for free? Do you want my kids to eat? Yeah. Do you, want, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so then that's you couldn't do that. You couldn't help people. You couldn't research. Couldn't. You couldn't go to big events nope. if they didn't pay you. Nope. So, um, and then you live in South Shields, right? So yeah. you're not in like New York or London or um, like LA. I'm in a tiny little town. You you live in a tiny little town. Did you yeah. ever think about moving? I, I I know you lived in Marbella for a bit, did, but did I you did. think about like if I move to a bigger town, I'd have more customers, or you just think that you're oh. you love your family and all that? You know what, Amia? I may have thought that if I hadn't made the mistake of moving to Spain. <laughs> so my thought was because again we we I mentioned it. My thought was don't um put out all the negative people from your life. So I did. And then I realized that everybody likes to complain. And that I was left with me who was complaining about people complaining. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I was left with that. And then, so I moved to Marbella and obviously that was a nightmare for me because I, I just had a two year holiday, gained all that weight, nearly ended, my marriage was nearly over. My kids were born there, but I moved home and I had a brand new appreciation for where I was from, how down to earth the people are, all of my friends, the mental, some of the mentality, I like, I love fighting. I love a bit of violence. Like I love all of that. And it's big for that up here. Um, and it's actually beautiful. I'm on the beach. I'm, I'm in the sea. My, my football, you'll know this in me. Football is a big value of mine. I love football. And I would miss that the most. I would. I would miss that the most. So we, me and my son travel, only last week we were in Madrid, watching Real Madrid. Me and my son travel all over. My, my daughter comes with us sometimes. Like, I would miss that too much. I would, and, and that's, I could go to New York, but let's face it, football in America. So you, you basically, then, you're a believer that we can make money from any town. Right? Hell yeah. Never be, it's never been easier, ever. Yeah. And I have thought, because I go to Dubai so much on holiday, people are like, why don't you just move here? And But the only reason I'd move there really, one is the weather. But someone said, well, what about the tax? And I'm like, I would not move my family to another country where they don't know anybody to save money on tax. Yeah. So, I, Like, I don't get that meant to save money on tax. You're going to, 
I think I, I actually don't think that's the truth. Sometimes the weather's great, but dude, I love living here. I love living here. I think though, when my kids are up and left school, I think that I may have somewhere where I live in the winter, but it wouldn't be a business decision. Do you and, know what I mean? Yeah. And and your do you find yourself coaching your friends and family all the time? Or yeah. is it like you separate the people yeah. that you're paid from and yeah. leave the people alone? Like if they're eating like chocolate, you'd say Oh dude, chocolate. do you know do you know where I learned this? It was actually when I was the fitness guy back in two thousand and one. People would ask me for advice and not take it, and I take it personally. Um, so now my friends kind of don't ask me. My friends and my family don't really ask me, and I don't preach to them either. I'm like, if you did ask me, I'll have no problem helping you, giving you advice that you won't take. Okay. And I think sometimes it's because they're my friend that they don't take, they wouldn't take it. Yeah. They take it from some random guy on TikTok, but they wouldn't take it from me, who's better. But that's just how it works. I mean, when I was a PT and my mum would ask me for advice, I'd spend hours putting my diet plans together and then she wouldn't do it. So I learned quite quickly that I remember this actually from my, from my speaking. I, I get flown all over the world to do talks, but I never get booked locally ever. Isn't that crazy? Ever. Really? And my friend said, my friend's a speaker. He does it full time. It's his only job. I just do it for fun sometimes and to get the travel in. And he said that it's almost like the further you are away from the town where, or the city where the gig is, the more you get paid. He said, people believe that the experts always from out of town. Yeah. And that makes sense because I'm sure there's somebody in Puerto Rico who lives there and they've flown me from the other side of the world. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a really interesting concept. And, and so what, what are the final sort of coaching points that you would say to people to get their life on track? Because Paul Mort, there, there's there's stuff that you can get a lot of content from Paul uh, yeah. for free that I, I say consume his books. You've got Paul. I'm just gonna share my screen uh, to to show your uh, this is your Unstoppable 28 program. Yeah, love it. Uh, so thank just, you for that, Amir. Second, uh, this is, by the way, how did you write this amazing copy? Was it, did you have a copywriter do it? No, I wrote, I write copy. I wrote, here's the skill that I developed. I, I, I think you should mention this. I think it'd be useful, Amir. Yeah. I, when I was miserable, when I moved away, I didn't want to be on camera and on video because I was fat and I was horrible and I was, eh, I was all over the place. So to, to make money, I had to learn copywriting. Because the, even then, there wasn't video back then. And I think I learned copywriting myself because I couldn't pay anyone else at, at a point in my life. And it's one of the best skills I've ever learned. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote all of that copy. Yeah. What, what do you write it in? Just like a Word file? And then you... you <laughs> Not you, even you... that, Amir. Not even that. Do you know the Notes app? Yeah. That you can sync your phone to your laptop? Yeah. I write on the Notes app. Everything I write is on the Notes app. And then I send that to a designer and he does the rest. Okay. Okay. You give it to a designer and then. Yeah, I don't do any of the stuff on there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because you've yeah. got like a lot of good copy. Um, yeah, and, and basically, but what you're saying is the skill, which is money making, you got. That from... is, think about what copy does. Yeah. Demonstrates that what you have is valuable. That's what copy does. Yeah. Yeah. And do yeah. people read? this the whole copy you think or they skim it i don't know and i don't care <laughs> okay. as long as it works i i am the type of person that would probably read it all but yeah. i can write copy so i'm i'm kind of i'm looking as to whether i'm buying i'm also probably learning at the same time yeah um, but what we're finding actually now things like online seminars webinars video does just as good a job as copy now and and i think it's becoming the less people have to read and the less people have to watch, the more success there is now because people's attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, although there is still a place for long form content, but yeah. Yeah, I think to get people's attention, you've got to stay in that pocket of, of um, being in people's being in people's face. 
And how do you plan your week? What what is it? Is it like because you have your your high end coaching program? Yes. Uh, yeah. Like how many roughly people do you have that come to that kind of program? So inside of inside of Unstoppable Alliance, which is my main program, twelve month program, we have about three hundred people. Oh wow! Inside of my Elite X program, which is my highest one on one program, we're full with twenty guys. Um, and then obviously we've got other programs people doing Unstoppable twenty eight. Um, but I plan my week. This is going to sound strange because I don't like planning. I don't like it at all. But what I do love is the results of planning. Mm -hmm. I used to convince myself that I didn't want a schedule because, oh, I want freedom. But actually, I ended up working more hours, more days because I didn't have structure. Structure creates freedom, right? Example, I said to you before, I'm going to Italy. Sorry, I'm going to Spain on Sunday for a week. And I don't have to take my phone. No email, no work. I'm uncontactable. And I can do that because of the level of structure. And I don't like doing it. I don't enjoy planning. So first thing I do is I believe that, and I learned this from Dr. John, if you don't fill your hours, your days, your weeks with activities and tasks that are high value, high priority, then the time will be filled for you with low value, low priority tasks that drain you. So I'm very clear on what high value tasks are. And I fill it first with personal things, exercise, workouts, um, my meditation, um, haircut, for example. I didn't do that this week, which by the way, is why I had to change the time of the podcast. <laughs> because I've got a speaking event tomorrow and I look like I was homeless. So I was like, I, was like, I can't, oh no, I forgot to, I forgot to book it. Yeah. Um, so apologies for that, by the way. Um, but I fill it for the personal things first. So it is things like maybe massage, maybe a walk, maybe jujitsu, maybe weight training, maybe yoga. That stuff goes in first because and football will go in first as well. Um, so if someone asks me if I want to do go and speak somewhere on a weekend where my team are playing, I'm like, no, I'm I'm going to this. It's a high priority. Because when I was struggling, I actually stopped doing that because we get taught that we shouldn't have hobbies. We shouldn't watch Netflix because hustlers don't do that. We shouldn't have lie-ins. Do you know what I mean? That's that's a mentality that I'm long done with. So personal stuff first. Then I put in things with my family next. So it's like I put in the big rocks first, the stuff that's most important. Then I put in the things that I've already been paid for because people have paid me for the service. And then I put in the things that, bring me the highest return on investment in terms of time. That's why you notice the, the the Telegram group, I'm not posting because it brings me for the time that I put in. It's not long, but there's not a big enough return on investment at the minute when I'm busy. When I'm less busy, that might come back because there's room in the jaw. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's how I plan it. And there's nothing in my journal, my diary right now that I hate doing. I don't, I think, I mean, clearly I've had to go through the period of doing things that I don't like, mm -hmm. but as soon as I can, I'll either find a different way to do the thing to get the result because it's not always the same way, right? Or I will delegate it to somebody else as fast as I can. It's never been easier to do that for cheap either. And you have a team that works with you behind Paul Mort? Yeah, I have five people in the office and I have four people who are... um online yeah so well, five five in hq four online do you believe in in the personal brand growing over the next yes. couple of years is that yes. is that bigger and bigger uh part of marketing yeah so the challenge that i have amir is that when you build when i'm building this personal brand i'm very aware that i don't really have a business that i can sell it's a list of people that love working with me i love my content so there's nothing really to sell. That means that I have to, so I have other business interests. I bought a hotel last year. <laughs> I've got some mad business. In, yesterday, I, I bought into another business that does a TRT. They're just about to open a clinic in Dubai. So I'm, into, I'm, 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 I'm getting yeah, small TRT, investments. Did you say? Yeah, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy. Oh, I was yeah. just talking to a friend. I'll ask you questions about that too. Uh, it's about, amazing. I'm it's 47 amazing. years old now. I was thinking, is Amir, it yeah. It is legit. My wife doesn't quite agree. 
<laughs> when I first went on. Anyway, so I mean, I'm making these investments because I know that I've got nothing to sell. However, what I love about personal brand is that if I have a personal brand, if I wanted to stop doing this now and do something else, I've already got the audience, the following. People know me. So you think about this. Proper 12 whiskey being valued at like a billion dollars or something would not exist without Conor McGregor. The Rock has a tequila brand worth the same that wouldn't exist without him. So the, the these brands are actually following and piggybacking the personal brand. Think about almost every business. Almost every business has a face. Nike, Jordan, right? Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So but someone else is getting a big deal like that soon as well. Someone else, someone's trying to create the new Michael Jordan. Who was it? It's a footballer, I think. Maybe Jude Bellingham, maybe. Yeah. They're trying to make it like a Bellingham boot, I think. So anyway, um, something like that. I can't remember the sport. Um, but yeah, I think personal brands never be never been more important. So I you, mean, yeah, I've talked about speaking to me, you know, and even my book, right? The difficulty in getting my book published is that in today's world, it almost doesn't matter how good the book is because most people don't finish a book and it's all about the sales of the book. And people will buy a book from a celebrity rather than a doctor, for example. They'll take advice from a celebrity, but not a doctor. It's That's backwards, isn't it? So mm -hmm. that's why personal brand's important. It's The world's changed. People make authorities of people based on how many followers they've got. It's insane. When I try to get book, when I do speaking gigs, I don't have a big following compared to a lot of my friends and a lot of my colleagues and peers. I have a small following. And sometimes they'll get booked before me and I'm much better than them. They know I'm much better than them, but they get booked because the person who is running an event has to fill the room. And if not enough people have heard of the, you could be an amazing speaker, but if not enough people have heard of you, they're not going to book you. Same with books. I I am I could write, and I think I have wrote an amazing book that could change people's lives. But if people don't know who I am, the publisher is going to be like, I'm not guaranteed sales. Whereas someone I'm from reality TV could write a book on the same topic as me. It could be way worse, but people will buy it. The publisher will sign them because they know that they're guaranteed a certain amount of sales. It might not be many, but it might be, it's the likelihood of it being more than some guy who hardly has any followers. It's kind of sad, isn't it? And I, and I believe that you need a lot of inner game and inner work to, to be, have that confidence to go out and promote a personal brand. I, like yeah. what, what yeah. advice would you give people like that? Because People are probably shy of posting content and yeah. looking looking silly if they if they send two something things. stupid. So two things here, and that's um, something that, that I can compliment you on that you've figured out. You can be yourself on stage, whereas a lot of people are. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, and I still get nervous, but it's because I can I want to do an amazing job, yeah. so I do get nervous. It doesn't matter how much I rehearse. The reality is, Amir, and I'm big on just doing this, do it without confidence. Confidence isn't just going to show up. You can't buy it. People can tell you're amazing and you wouldn't believe them, right? You're not born with it. You don't have it. So you have to do things without confidence, without self-doubt. And what better time to do it when hardly anyone knows who you are? Yeah. So do the terrible videos first. You have, it's like saying, here's what people think. It's like saying, I will start going to jujitsu when I'm a black belt. <laughs> it don't make any sense. You have to start as a white belt. When you're a white belt, you are going to get folded in half. You are going to get twisted up into a pretzel by a 14-year-old boy, right? I'm not kidding. Yeah. So you have to be willing to do it knowing that you're going to get your ass kicked. It's like the, the cost of entry is fear. The cost of entry is criticism. So you've got to ask yourself, do I actually want to go into the park? If I want to go into the park, I've got to pay the price. And the price is criticism. And it's never as bad as you think it is. Dude, I make con I have a whole, tomorrow, I have a five-minute segment on the stage where I just share 
the criticism that I've had. I, I put slides up and I say, look what this guy said. Did you see the video I did the other week of people criticizing me? Did you I've see that one? Uh, quite a few. Oh, you, you get a lot of. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one blew up. So what we did was I made a video where I would just be doing something and then someone that I knew would come up to me and say the thing that someone typed about me on the internet. And I'd be like, excuse me? And it, yeah. that video blew up for me. But that's that's why I almost am, I've found a way to use the criticism so that they actually give me an opportunity. So they're like, they give me fuel. They give they don't give me anger. I'm like, I can write an email on this. Oh, amazing, I can put this in a video. Oh, amazing, more content. Oh, amazing, I can look funny. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I just use all of that. I love it. Now, I used to get angry. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I still do get angry. Like if someone says you should have killed yourself, that's not okay. And I'll tell them and I'll call them out. That's not okay. Because that could have been someone that isn't able to take that comment. And it could be the last thing to ever read. That's not okay. If you want to call me names, amazing. I love that. If you want to, if you want to argue with me, good luck. I'm not joining in. But if you want to say something like that, I'm not. I'm not cool with that. Because you, if you said that to me in the street, I put you to sleep. I mean, what 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 advice would you have for people that are suicidal? Um, that be, because I I think suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of forty five in the UK. Yep, um, insane. Yeah. So, like, what what advice would you have for people? And have you have you encountered people that are suicidal? And what every is week, your thought process? Every every single week, I get a message saying. Can you help me with my suicidal thoughts? So first things first, this whole narrative of just talk, I'm not having it. Talking does not cook rice, as Bruce Lee said. It could be a start. It could be an unload. But if you then change nothing, you wasted your breath. Pointless. So the reality is this. Someone that is rock bottom, you got to understand that you didn't end up there by accident, right? It wasn't a mistake. But the common denominator in people that are rock bottom is that they cannot see the future. They cannot, they don't have a vision of the future. They don't have something that they're moving towards. So you have to have, even if it's just a plan and an idea of what you want to do tomorrow, because when you're depressed, you are focused on everything that you hate, everything you've done wrong everyone that's done wrong to you. And so you feel that. And guess when that happened? In the past. All happened in the past. So we need to start shifting our thinking to what it is we want. Because we, you, you're focused on how you don't want to feel all of the time. And you think the only way to not feel like that is by ending it. So we have to shift our focus onto the future, onto what we want, starting with maybe how we want to feel. That's it. And ultimately... <laughs> Part of us has to think, well, what am I doing that I know I shouldn't be? Or what am I not doing that I know I should be? But it's it's essentially when I'm talking about um, suicide, whenever there's anybody suicidal, I say, the first thing I do is look at their profile. If they've got kids, they're fucked up. It's took a long time. They are, they've got no chance with me because I'm like, what? And leave those children with no dad. Come on, I'll call people out on it. Because that's what I needed to hear. So I try and create, well, who would be, I get it, who would be impacted if you did do that? Because it will change their life forever. And you're going to make them feel like it's their fault forever. And then that usually shifts them. And then get them focused on, well, what's next for you? What goals have you got? What are you moving towards? What do you want? What do you want to do? Like, what are you most excited about? And that could just be what you got going on this weekend. I'd say, I say shifting the focus and looking at what you're doing that's got you there. Because again, you don't catch depression. You don't catch it. It's not contagious. It's created. And it's created through your focus and your physiology. And do you, do you are you a believer that people that have got depression, they should go get pills? Or do you think that most people can get out of depression by, you know, going through your programs or uh, yeah. learning skills to get it out, get their thinking right? It's a great question. So first up, I am not a medical professional. I'm not a doctor. And I think for some people, that medication can be useful. 
it can be useful. What we got to think about is those, that medication is to address a chemical imbalance. Well, that's what I hear anyway. Apparently that's not even true. But that chemical imbalance doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't happen on its own. Chemical imbalances in the brain are down to what we think. Down to what we think. Any kind, and what we put in our mouth and up our nose and all that kind of stuff. It matters, right? Um, so some people need to go to the doctors because they, they just need quick relief. They can't see a way out. And that's a start. But again, I am diagnosed bipolar, but I don't take medication. So I'm a really bipolar. I'm diagnosed ADHD, but I don't take medication. Does that? It doesn't mean I don't believe in medication. This it's just I choose not to. Because the, the, what happened to me and me, I was when I was diagnosed bipolar, they put me on lithium, lithium carbonate is the gold standard. I didn't have mood swings. I just felt shite all of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean, I didn't have mood swings anymore, and so I used to go like this. And then I found the new level was like this here, awful. Yeah. Like just a little bit higher than rock bottom. And I felt like a zombie. Um, and I and I overhauled my life. I stopped drinking. I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't gone. I think I'd not drank for like six months, which is the world record for me back then. Now I'm two and a bit years. Um, but even then, I, I probably drank once a quarter, maybe, so four or five times a year. And I looked, I said, I'm doing everything right. I've stopped drinking. I'm exercising. Look at how much weight I've lost. Why do I still feel rubbish? And it was the only reason that I could think of was this. And I had to get medical supervision. I had to get my bloods taken every single week for, I think, about four months because lithium is that toxic that if you stop taking it, you die. I mean, that can't be good for you. That cannot be good for you. So medication, I think, definitely has its uses. I'm not a doctor, so I wouldn't know. However... It just depends what you want. I'm like, am I going to take this forever? I'm going to take this pill forever. What are the side effects of this? Oh, am I going to take control? Because you see a lot of people that take antidepressants, and then guess what they do? The same as what they did before the antidepressants. So therefore, they either keep taking it forever, but the, the effectiveness of it wears off, so they have to take more and more and more. Or they, they can overhaul their life. Wow. So yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a really interesting thing because it does lose it. In fact, there is a study that, and again, I can't quote, I can't remember. Dr. Joe Dispenza talked about it, where there is a study where they took a big group of people, gave one of them antidepressant and one of them a, a, a placebo, and they both got the same result, exactly the same result. So does that mean antidepressants work? I don't know, but it also means the placebo works. The, the, the very fact that you think you are taking an antidepressant makes you, well, get lift your depression. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You just yeah. think you're taking an antidepressant and yet, yeah. and what? What? So if you, th I think it's the act of thinking you're doing something healthy. Mm -hmm. You think you're doing something useful. You think you're doing something wholesome. Mm -hmm. That's big. That's, yeah. That shows you how powerful your brain is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm someone that has, dealt with depression and, and I had to deal with, with, um, down, uh, being down in life. Yeah. And I think when you come to a program like yours, which is in a room live with people, it you gives have to be ready, natural endorphins or whatever it is, because people pump you up. Um, and, and so like, yeah. when, when you, when you do that, I, I think that is like one of the, one of the good things about like when I was living in the UK, was that there was events and then even, you know, you go out and you meet people that are coming to a Paul Mort uh, event and they're, they're all like buzzing off something. And so you, you yeah. feel, you get that contagiousness. Yeah. And again, do you know what? It can be hard because I talk about the concept, this all of the time and people are like, well, where do I find these groups? Where do I find these people? But what people are expecting, they're expecting them to be a group like that on the same street. You have to travel. You have to get out of your environment. Yeah. You can't expect these people to come to you. And this is my problem with some of these support groups. Like the challenge is you're in a support group of people who keep talking about their past. Mm. That's not every single one. But I'm like, well, remind like anxiety support groups. What do you do? Remind yourself that you, that you get anxious. Mm. But I got, I literally eliminated anxiety from my life. And one of the biggest things I did was stop talking about it. Why do you think people get anxiety? 
they created they create inappropriate risk assessments what do you mean? Like they, they, yeah because i had someone um yeah th 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 that that called me and they're like oh i i um i slept with someone and do you think i have aids you know like um j j and then i was like you're gonna put yourself in this sort of um you know all anxiety you got to think about this anxiety means disordered fear so there's no order to the fear fear is a normal emotion anxiety isn't it's inappropriate. It's an inappropriate response to fear. Mm. And so we create these inappropriate, we create risk assessments. And one of the big denominators in this is, well, think about what makes you anxious, thoughts. I, I just started creating a life that didn't have room for inappropriate risk assessments. People that create anxiety, because it's not caught, it's not contagious, you're not ill, right? People that create anxiety have a high creative intellect, right? Mm. So the high level problem solvers. There's some people that are just chill. They're not problem solvers most of the time. So we, we have a high level. It's not IQ. It's not intelligence. We have a high creative intellect. So when we're not solving enough problems that we care about, we're not learning things. We're not immersing ourselves in subjects, in goals, in targets. We're not busy mentally and physically. Boredom is anxiety's greatest ally. Boredom is anxiety's greatest ally. Because we're creating, because we're not solving enough problems, we make them up. Your brain makes them up. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's a, this was, and by the way, I know this because I used to have or create anxiety so bad that I had to get sedated on a flight. Like oh, I couldn't have it. a, I couldn't go to the, a public toilet. I couldn't get on a train. I couldn't get on a bus. Once I had to get out of a taxi because I created a panic attack. Like this has been, this was crippling for me and learning this stuff like was life changing, like life changing. So it was basically learning this, what you said that changed it. Someone told you, and it's kind of like you're being a lawyer to your yes. mind, right? Yes. Like you're making arguments to your mind about yes. changing yes. the way you think. I just got no room. There's no, how can I have it? If I am immersed in what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. immersed in where I'm going, immersed in what I'm learning. Where does the anxious thought fit? There's no room. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm what I'm going to teach later. I'm what I'm going to learn. And like, what language am I learning? What am I, what are my goals? How can I make progress on my goals today? When am I picking the kids up? What are the kids' goals? What are we, there's no room for this absolute horse crap. Mm -hmm. And no room for it. You, you, by the way, you are a big proponent of journaling, right? I love, the, I love journal. Can I'm you like just a teenage talk? girl. Can you just talk people about what's journaling and why it's important in their life? So the style of journaling that I love and that I share and I teach and has, again, been a game changer for me is what I call prompted journaling, which basically means you answer questions. You're not like, and my day was this today and this is my kind of mood and then he said this and she did this. That's not for me. So prompted journaling is a question that is, or answering questions that are loaded. And what I mean by loaded, they're loaded towards you giving a positive answer. That's based on this concept that I have called discipline. Discipline is the discipline to only, to put our attention and our focus only on things that make us feel good. So that is what you want and what's working. What most people are focused on is what they don't want and what isn't working right? What they're not good at, what they could have done, what the wish doesn't, won't happen, right? What the hope does, all of that, that's what they're focused on. So if I take that in mind, the questions are loaded in a way. So the question is either about what you want or what's working. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I learned from a friend of mine, Peter, um, that he said, questions are the steering wheel of the mind. So these questions are designed to steer your mind towards this concept of discipline. That's it. So in the morning is mainly spent focused on what we want, what we want to get done, what we are, who we want to impact in a positive way, what our goals are. I also have a new question, which was based on the night before. On an evening, it's retrospective journaling. So this is intentional journaling. The last one is retrospective journaling. What happened today? What worked? Who didn't have a positive impact on today? Um, what did I do well? What was the best part of my day? 
And then the next morning, one of the questions is, what was your biggest win yesterday? So I will write down, the, the journal has changed quite a bit now um, in the last three months. The, the guys have to write down the five wins that they had that day. However small, however big, five wins. And if you write down five wins a day for seven days, that's 35 wins a week. Do you think that might build some confidence and self-belief? That's just a week. Imagine doing that every day. I've done that every day since 2016, at least three. That's why I've got confidence and self-belief because I've got evidence. I'm not saying be confident. Be, I'm, I've got evidence that I am who I say I am. I've got evidence that I'm a producer. I've got evidence that I get things done. I've got evidence that I have people in my life that I'm grateful for. I've captured and I can see it now. I don't have to believe it. I can see the facts. I'm stacking up evidence that I am who I say I am. I am who I'm trying to become. Most people just try and guess their way there. So yeah, journaling has been a, a, a massive, a massive part of my life. I just, it's not, it kind of needs a new word because it sounds a bit weird, especially for British men. They're like, what? You do what? It kind of needs a different name. That's why I like the, the term prompted journaling or loaded journaling. Yeah. And and you you wear these t-shirts, say what you'll uh, do what you said you would do what you say you'll do, right? Yeah. And so just tell us what, what's that about? So this is so th this came about, it's one of the first things I ever said in this coaching game was when I was struggling, I'd say I would do things and I wouldn't do them. And then what that created was a lack of trust. Nobody trusted me because I made promises and I'd break them. So nobody trusted me. But the worst part is I didn't trust myself. So then what changed for me is I started just doing what I said I would do. And what started to happen was I'd like myself a little bit more every time I did that. My self-worth would go up and just a tiny little bit every single time. It was like I was making deposits into my, my personal emotional bank account, making little deposits into my self-belief, into my into my self-worth mm -hmm. so that every time I did that it just got and then everyone else started trusting me I became reliable mm -hmm. so this is huge I'm almost like what would happen if you just did what you said you would and nothing else just what you said you would so then it also makes you think I'm like stop making promises that you know you can't keep so I'm very honest with this I'm very honest with what I, what my boundaries are will you do this no rather than oh I might just like no so because I know that if I say, it's like I said to you, I didn't want to make, I don't want to make promises that I can't keep a lot of the time. That's what I said to you right at the start, didn't I? Yeah. yeah I yeah. didn't want to make a promise that I couldn't keep because then you wouldn't trust me and then I wouldn't trust myself. And then I'm just, and if you do that over time, you just, you're making withdrawals. And then next thing you know, you're in debt with your self worth. Yeah. Yeah. And I am getting so much wisdom for you from you here. So I'm, I'm sure people are learning a lot. What wisdom would you give to being a better parent, a better yeah. husband, a better student, and a better yeah. teacher? Do what you said you would. <laughs> Do what? Yeah. I mean, the first bit of advice. But in terms of all of that, I think an overriding theme here is you have to be the lighthouse. Not the tugboat trying to save everybody. Not the person giving everybody advice that they wouldn't take, that they're not, that they're not personally taking. Not the one that preaches or lectures but live your life as an example. Why would people listen to you if you're not doing it yourself? Mm -hmm. Why would people, it's like taking advice from a dentist with terrible teeth. You're not going to do it, right? So why would my kids listen to me rattling on about being tidy, doing the homework? Why would they listen to me if I'm not doing that? Why would they listen to me about eating healthy when I'm not? Why would my clients listen to me about doing what you said you would do when I'm not, when I'm unreliable? They wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So no, but for me, it's like, be the lighthouse. You just, you stand there, you shine your light and people will come to you or they won't. What many people do is they're trying to be the tugboat, rescuing everybody or giving people advice and preaching and all that kind of stuff. So being better, I think you have, you have to be better for you first and then you become a lighthouse. You're the example. Wow. Yeah. Look, Paul, Because your energy, you do that and your energy will either inspire people or it'll demotivate them. Um. Yeah. I'm, I'm, my energy is good because I'm excited all of the time. Yeah. Look, Paul, I could sit here and listen to you for a whole day, but I, I could talk about myself for a whole day. <laughs> but yeah, that was awesome. I really, I really got talk. some huge nuggets and I, like I've learned a lot and I'm turning 47 this week. So like, I'm, Happy sure, birthday. I'm sure people that are listening 
whether they're 27 or 67, are going to get a lot of value from what you said. And I, I think it. they might have to listen to it once or twice um, ju just to get that. As I said, you can get a lot of information on paulmort.com or, um, or join one of his programs. People join it from all over the world. I've done his programs. They're great stuff. Go watch him live when you can, if you get the opportunity. Definitely the best coach in the UK, but I'm sure around the world, you're going to see him around the world as well. So I appreciate that so much. So thank you so much, Paul Mort. And just check out paulmort.com. This has been Amir and Zor with Paul.